welcome everybody to all of our campuses today, meeting throughout the Twin Cities. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online around the country and world. We do consider you a part of our congregation. We know you're out there, so welcome to you as well. It is, it is great to be back. Some of you might have noticed that I've been away on a July break. Some of you are like, who's that guy? And you don't care at all, but that's fine. But I've been away just kind of catching my breath, getting ready for what I think is going to be a fantastic August and an unbelievable fall. But uh, this summer's already been amazing here at church. God continues to bless us. We measure our annual year from July to July. And so this past year, our average in-house attendance on our campuses was over 22,000, 22,200. Online attendance was over 13,000 for an average combined attendance every single weekend of 35,500. But the number that just blows me away every time I look at it is this number right here, 6,001 are the number of people who just this past year made a decision to follow Christ. And I love that number one, yeah. I love... I love this number one. I'd love to know who that is because every person matters to God and matters to us. Uh, just a fantastic year we've had so far. I was at our baptism three weeks ago. Another record baptism, 1,100 people, 47. I met a 62-year-old man, a uh, big, tough guy. He was standing there all wet. I just kind of bumped into him, and he said to me, I grew up going to church but quit when I was young got into all kinds of trouble, made a mess of my life, divorced, broken, but six months ago, he said, I was invited to this church, and it saved me. I said, well, how long had it been since you've been in a church? He said, 30 years, and now he's been baptized and following Christ with all of his being. I could show you a lot of photographs from our baptism. One of my favorite ones is this. This is uh, of Travis Sharn is on the far right. He's our campus pastor at Blaine. And Drew on the other end here is one of our worship leaders. But uh, Sarah, Travis's wife Sarah, is there next to him, and she's got her hand up like this, and she was being baptized that day. On the far left here uh, is, his, is her sister and brother-in-law, and they watch online from Duluth. And they drove down to be baptized that day. In the middle are Sarah's parents, they live up near Grand Rapids, Minnesota, watch us every weekend, watching today. They drove down to be baptized, and then next to Sarah is her brother, Andrew, and he watches online every weekend from Idaho, flew in from Idaho to be here to be baptized that day, and I could just go on and on telling about stories about this, uh, but I'm so proud, by the way, of Jason Strand, our teaching pastor. Uh, we are so blessed, by the way. I, I hope you understand that, how blessed we are to have him and John Alexander and others who teach uh, just did a bang-up job this summer. So thankful for our children's staff who roll up their sleeves every weekend and you know, teach and lead our kids. And our student leaders are some of the best in the country. Just a couple, you know, a few days ago, they did the summer takeover for middle school students over a 1,000 kids, three nights in a row, three nights in a row came and came to a, ch you get this, came to a church in the middle of summer. A 1,000 middle school kids came to a church three nights in a row. 147 of them said yes to Christ for the first time, and we're just so proud. Musicians, tech, volunteers, you're the best. Couldn't do it without you. We still need more of you, so roll up, man. Come on. Get on board. Many weekends, I'm telling you, I'll worship over here with my wife, and I'm not speaking, and I just end up in tears. I just sit back and watch what, what God has chosen to do. So as we look to finish out the summer, I hope all of you will make a new commitment to never miss church. Lead yourself. Lead your family if you have one, and then pray for an opportunity to invite at least one other person who's just drifting through life aimlessly and could benefit from having a relationship with God through Christ, okay? Well, today is the first message to, to our series called Done With That, based on a new book that comes from a lifelong struggle I have had personally with 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says this, if anyone's in Christ, he or she is a new creation, the old life is gone, the new life has come. 
I have heard that verse taught so many times throughout my life. My dad was a pastor. I, I used to listen to him teach on this verse. Over and over, I would hear pastors and teachers say, look, once you become a Christian, everything changes. The old life is gone, a new life has come. And I would hear that teaching, and I would think to myself, well, then what's wrong with me? Because if the old life is gone, why do I still sin? Struggled with this as a teenager, college student, all through my 30s, 40s, and even today. Why do I still get angry at times, jealous, selfish, and afraid? Maybe something's wrong with my faith, is what I would often think. So I grew up with a lot of guilt, a lot of confusion over this verse. Because the old life I discovered really is not gone inside of me. So that's what this book is all about. Uh, what does it mean to be done with the old life and start living this new life the Bible talks about? Well, a couple of years ago, just to kick this off, my wife and I drove down to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota to visit my daughter and son-in-law who was in residency there. But on the way down traveling south on Highway 52 that day, there were several road construction projects on the northbound lane that would affect our travel coming back home later that evening. And at one point, my wife said, Bob, look at all the traffic going north. They're in a standstill. I said, well, by the time we return home, it shouldn't be a problem. Well, we had a great day in Rochester, and as we drove home going north, we came to a construction zone, but the traffic was no problem at all. So I said to my wife, see, no traffic. We're going to fly right through. But she said, this wasn't the spot with all the traffic, it was closer to the Twin Cities. Now, knowing that she was wrong, <laughs> I corrected her and said, no way, this is the spot, I'm sure of it. She matched my intensity and said, no, this isn't the spot, it was closer to the cities, just wait and see. Now, a wiser man would have let it lay would have realized that even if I was right, and I was, there was nothing to be gained by proving that I was right. Instead, I said, no. I'm absolutely positive this is the spot. And I knew I was right. In fact, she was wrong, and I knew this. In fact, I was so sure of it, I said, I will bet you a hundred bucks that I'm right, which is so stupid. Because she manages our money anyway, but I said, I'll bet you a hundred bucks this is the spot. There are no other spots. I marked it in my memory. And I could tell that I had planted a seed of doubt inside my wife's mind, and she was softening, which made me all the more confident and sure. She said, well, I still think it's closer to the city. I said, nope, this is the spot. And then I said, I can't believe you doubt me on this. She said, are you kidding me? You've been wrong on stuff like this all the time. I said, yeah, but not this time. <laughs> and I was right. So right. So sure. So happy. Until about 20 miles south of Twin Cities. I, I noticed an orange construction sign ahead, followed by some orange barrels, and then a line of traffic backed up for miles. I came to a complete stop. Stop on the freeway. I was hoping my wife wouldn't notice. <laughs> but she did notice. Now, she's generally a kind and loving and forgiving person, but not this time. She was boiling mad, and it struck my funny bone. It just made her all the more mad. And then, gang, it happened right there on the freeway. She called me a bad word. She called me a donkey's rear end, only the rear thing, real thing. She called me a jackass. I couldn't believe it. I said, I said, you are not allowed to call me that. She said, well, that's what you are. Some of you women are clapping. I don't know why. Don't clap. And then under her breath, she said, idiot. And I'll tell you what, that was a moment. That was a moment. And again, it just struck me funny, and I laughed and laughed. It just made her so mad. 
Now, early in our marriage, I can tell you that battle of the wills would have sent us into a tailspin for three days. Thankfully, that doesn't happen much these days because we're old. We just don't have the energy to fight. <laughs> We've learned to let a lot of stuff go. But what happened in the car that day still happens on occasion. We get into a tangle, words start flying, we slink into our corners, and we think to ourselves, why is that person such a jerk? When the reality is, why am I such a jerk? Why am I such a donkey's rear end at times? The Bible says the old life is gone. The new life is come, but the old life is not gone. The old life of anger, pride, selfishness is sometimes right there and it bubbles up. Skin deep. I've been a Christian 57 years. I pray, I read the Bible, teach it for a living. But I can tell every one of you, I still sin. And by the way, so do you. Every single one of us do. And here, here's my definition of sin. You can chew on this a while. There's other definitions. But I think sin is anything that damages relationships. Different than a habit. There can be good habits, bad habits. But sin is whenever it damages or hurts yourself or somebody else. The truth is we all still sin. So what did Paul mean when he said the old life is gone? I gave a lot of thought to this. And I think there's at least three things that are gone. And the first one is being separated from God is gone. Ephesians 2 says you are no longer separated from God if your faith is in Jesus Christ. If you've put your faith in Christ, you are in God's family. You are a son or daughter of the living God. He knows you, loves you. That will never change. You are not separated from God. That is completely gone. The penalty for sin is gone. When Jesus took the world's sin on himself, paid the penalty for your sins and mine, every single one, past, present, and future, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins by his life and death on the cross, the supreme sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The penalty, we no longer have to be afraid of paying the penalty for sin. That's gone. And the bondage to sin is gone. We all still will sin at times. But we don't have to be in bondage to it. We don't have to be enslaved by it. Romans 6, 6 says it this way. Our old self was crucified means our old self, our old selfishness and way of life was actually killed when we put our faith in Christ. There was a death that took place in us, was crucified with him, so we should no longer be slaves to sin. We all still sin, but we don't have to be in bondage to it, so all of that is gone. What isn't gone is our tendency to still sin. And the prevailing thought in society is that we're all basically good. But the Bible teaches we are all born sinners. And if you have kids, you understand that, right? No one had to te teach my kids how to sin or my grandkids. They came out of the chute as life-sucking little sinners. <laughs> and that continues to, to adulthood. Some of you are clapping, thanking, you know, just acknowledging that truth. Thank you for that. We all still sin. But Romans 6.12 says this, don't let sin control you. Don't give in to its desires. So we all still do it, but it doesn't have to control us. Now, gang, the problem is there's a battle going on inside of us between the sinful human nature and God's spirit. Look how Paul says it in Galatians 5. Live according to your new life in the spirit. We have a choice to do that. Live according to your new life in the spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature, there's that word, sinful nature, craves. These two forces, God's spirit and the sinful nature, 
are constantly fighting each other inside you and your choices are never free from this conflict. And so there's this battle going on between the old life and new life, between our sinful human nature that still lives within every believer and God's spirit. And this conflict never stops. A couple verses later, he says, the acts, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Now, maybe they're not so obvious. So he lists them. I'm going to show you a few of them. This isn't a complete list. And whenever Paul gives a list, he always leads with sexual immorality. And if you missed last week's message, Jason Strand on sexual immorality, you got to watch that message. This is so devastating to every human being. So Paul just lists it. This is the sinful human nature. By the way, we are drawn to these things. Impure thoughts, selfishness. I don't know about you, but I'm selfish by nature. I get jealous. I've been deceptive before. Hatred, quarreling, rage sometimes, drunkenness, strife. And then Paul says, all these things about our sinful nature, they all end up in kind of a death-like existence. Death to relationships, death to career, death to all these things that we want. Two verses later, though, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit, These are the things of the sinful nature, but the fruit of the Spirit, God's Spirit wants to produce these things in us. A new kind of love. By the way, love is really, really hard. Love involves being patient with people who are hard to be around. It involves forgiveness, overlooking faults, and telling the truth. I mean, come on, let's just be honest and truthful. So that's what love is. Joy, peace. God will give a new peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Here's one, self-control. God wants to bring self-control and relational wholeness. And Paul says, these things lead to life in its fullness. These things lead to death. Those things lead to life. And Paul says, there's this ongoing conflict going on inside every single believer, not unbelievers, they could care less, really. Just live and let live. They don't have the spirit of God living in them. But there's a conflict inside every single believer, and whichever way we tip will either produce death in our lives or life. So in the time we have left, I want to give you three ways to defeat the old sinful nature that resides inside every one of us. All through the New Testament and Bible, uh, it says, be led by the Spirit. Or it says, be filled by the Spirit, or be controlled by the Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God lives inside every single believer, but sin will constrain the Spirit, will deaden the Spirit's work. doesn't leave you, but we need to be led by So every single day, I just pray, God, lead me by your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Control me by your spirit. I need your power, and I need your help. And the need for God's power to be led by God's spirit can just rise up unexpectedly. A few weeks ago, we moved our daughter and son-in-law from Missouri to Pittsburgh for his fellowship year at the University of Pittsburgh, finally last year of being just all over the country and world getting educated. So we decided to give them our used Passat, our car, because their car is simply terrible and undrivable. So Nellie was going to drive the U-Haul truck from Missouri to Pittsburgh. And my daughter Meg was flying with the two little girls uh, from Missouri to Pittsburgh, missed their connection in Chicago. And it was just a nightmare of a trip. My daughter and her two little girls was in full meltdown calling my wife on the phone every half hour just in tears and I can't do this. I can no longer put up with this. I, you know, just a nightmare. She arrived in Pittsburgh at 3 a.m. with two little girls. It's a mess, but that's not the story. In the meantime, my wife and I were driving the car we were going to give them from Twin Cities here to Pittsburgh, and it was after church. I had spoken that Sunday afternoon just six weeks ago. 
And so I was, I was exhausted. We pulled off in Janesville, Wisconsin to a Holiday Inn Express. And at the counter was an older couple checking in. Now, one of my spiritual gifts is making snap judgments about people who annoy me. <laughs> and this lady was a piece of work. This older woman had both arms draped across the counter, demanding things from this poor young clerk behind the counter. And it didn't take long for me to make a judgment call. This lady was pushy. She was entitled. And she was manipulative because she was old. But she wasn't that old. She was just using that as an excuse to get her way. Her poor husband was standing about five paces behind her. He looked totally defeated because he'd been run over all his life. And I was discerning this all in 10 seconds. <laughs> but I was trying to let the spirit lead me and gain self-control and Bob, you know, just ease off. And I was doing okay <laughs> until I met this lady about two hours later at an elevator. We were both on the second floor. I was coming from the workout room. She was coming from her room. And I wanted to go to the fifth floor to our room, and she wanted to go to the first floor down to the lobby, probably to complain about something else. <laughs> we were on a crash course heading for the one lone elevator, but I was 20 yards ahead of her and clearly had dibs. <laughs> so I pushed the up button, she rounded the corner, stepped right into my space, and pushed the down button, and my up button turned off, and her down button turned on, and in that moment, I thought to myself, nope, nope, not going to happen. No way is this old lady going to violate elevator etiquette. Not going to happen. Had she been a kind, gentle, you know, normal person, no problem. The door opened, she stepped in and quickly tried to hit floor number one, but she missed. No kidding, I slipped my hand and hit number five. <laughs> Never met this lady in my life. She turns to me and she says, I hope you didn't mess me up. <laughs> I smile. I said, I think we're going to take a ride to the fifth floor. <laughs> and we did. It was the longest elevator ride in my life. <laughs> Silence, daggers from her. I... Now, I'll let you decide if I was right or wrong in that. But I assure you, without God's spirit controlling me, I would have told her off. She's in conflict with everybody at the desk, elevator. Her husband's given up long ago. And, but I did, in a moment of, you know, did I do the right thing? I, I did ask myself, I wonder what Jesus would have done. <laughs> so when I got home, I told Jason Strand this story. I said, Jason, what do you think Jesus would have done? He said, oh, Jesus would have hit button number five and gone to the fifth floor. <laughs> because when you're being led by God's spirit, it doesn't mean you let people run all over you. But you don't have to tell them off. Truth and love. Truth is you hit button number five. <laughs> love is you just kind of smile. <laughs> let it land. The Bible says you got to be led by. Filled by. Controlled by God's. Anybody here out of control? With your words? Just let it rip. With your anger, drinking, spending, partying, making a mess? What if you ask God's spirit every single day, God, I need you. Fill me. Lead me. Control my words. Control my behavior. Be led by God's spirit. Second way to defeat this old nature, got to identify your signature sin. So I was thinking about my own struggle with the old life. I realized that I battle some sins more than others, don't you? And there's one sin that seems to be my signature sin. I'll tell you about it in a second. But 
what would you say is yours? That no matter how many times you said to yourself, I'm never going to do that again, and then it happens. For me, it's verbal misconduct. I've struggled all my life with saying offensive things. And for those of you who are saying, come on, Bob, there's got to be something bigger than that. Well, let me remind you how lethal, hurtful words are. Proverbs says the tongue has the power of life, can breathe life into people, into your family, your kids, your spouse, or it can just kill them, kill their spirit, cut them to the core. Words can harm people so badly. Cyberbullying with teens today leads a lot of teens to just take their life. Words have the power of life or death. I'm not saying I don't struggle with other sins because I do, but the one with the most potential to ruin my relationships and derail my career is my big mouth. So what's yours? I think to defeat the old life, you have to know what you're up against. You have to know what you're fighting. So what sin is most ingrained in you? that prevents you from living this life of love and joy, peace and wholeness. And if you don't know what it is, let me ask a couple of questions. You know, what habit or behavior causes the most pain for you and others? Pain is always a signal that something's wrong. If you're experiencing emotional pain or relational pain, why is that? Could be from somebody else, but it could be you have a part in that? Pain is always a signal. A close cousin to pain is loss. So what habit or behavior causes you to lose things? Like friends, jobs, money, health. You know, some of you, I, just, I, I ache over this. Some of you are in a constant state of loss. Maybe because of an addiction. If you're addicted to something... Life is hard enough that that's a loser. It's going to lose. It's going to cause loss in your life. It could be pornography. I'm telling you, if you're, if you're into that, you're going to lose. Could be harsh words. Could be dishonesty. People know that about you. They're not going to trust you. Could be entitlement, creating laziness, and somebody owes me. That's a loser. I'm not saying... You're the, but that's a losing proposition. Some of you might say, but Bob, it's not, it's not me. It's my idiot boss. It's my mother. It's my father. It's my brother, sister. It's my friend, my cousin. They're the problem. It's my son or daughter. They're the problem. And they might be. By the way, if they are struggling or if they're addicted to something dishonest, abusive, that needs to be confronted in the right way, in the right time. I get it. They have to be. But right now, I'm asking you about you. As sinful as other people are, is there something in your life that God wants to help you overcome your signature sin? What is it? Now, the good news is you're not alone. Even the biblical writer Paul wrote these words. He says, look, I don't understand what I do. It's a biblical writer. He wrote scripture. I don't understand what I do sometimes. What I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, that's what I end up doing. That's his signature sin. He doesn't tell us what it is. But he struggled too. We're in this together. We all struggle with something. Some of us, many things. So the goal is to be honest about that. Identify what it is. Decide to fight it. And then ask God's help to, to overcome it and gain ground. Third way, final way today to defeat this old nature. you got to develop new desires. I've talked about this before, but the Bible says don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to its desires. One way to weaken our desire for sin is to develop new desires. You know, how do you do that? How do you develop new, des new desires? David wrote, he says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you new desires. Chase after God. And he will change your desires. 
In fact, we'll throw that up on the screen here. When we chase after God, he'll change our desires. That's what this verse means. When we pursue God, he will give us new desires for a new kind of love, joy, peace, kindness, relational wholeness. And our desire for things that bring us pain and loss will begin to die because we just, it's just so awful to live that way. Two years ago, I, I stood in front of this congregation and I, I raved about Italian gelato. And I said, once you taste gelato, your desire for Kemp's ice cream will die. I said it this way. I said, when you start getting a taste for God's love and God's peace and joy, the life of anger, dishonesty, sexual impurity, relational strife will lose its attraction and you won't be able to get enough of it. Well, the national headquarters for Kemp's ice cream is in St. Paul. So when I said, get a taste of gelato, your desire for Kemp's will die, our office got a call from Kemp's. Because evidently, the director of sales attends our church. And he showed up Monday morning at our office complex asking if he could have a word with me. Now, my assistant offered to run interference, but I told her, no, I got to go down and, and face this guy myself. So I went down to meet him. <laughs> but instead of being mad, he stood in our lobby holding an armful of Kemp's ice cream with a big smile on his face. He had 64 pints of all kinds of different flavors like sweet cream, espresso mocha, strawberry rhubarb bar, bar, cobbler. His name is Guy Fix. And he looks like a Guy Fix. Look at him. He's all smiley and winsome. He unloaded eight pints into my arms and then ran out to his truck and got a boatload more. So I tried a few pints. And all Guy said to me, he said, look, just taste and see. Just try it. So I did, and it was shockingly good. So over in Romans chapter 8, Paul tries to describe in words how good the new life is, how good God's love is. And he can't even describe it. He says how high, how deep, how amazing that words can't even describe it. And what it comes down to is you just have to try it. And so David wrote in Psalm 34, Taste and see that God is good, not just once, but every single day. I eat ice cream every single day. I got to taste and find out and remind myself how good it is. And David's saying, do the same with God. Lean into him every single day. Experience his love every single day. Because here's the truth. People often pursue everything but God. We try to fill our lives with an endless stream of media, entertainment, sports, traveling, and then wonder why something feels like it's missing. There's nothing, gang, I'm telling you, I'm 62 years old now. I've lived a lot of life. There is nothing on this planet that you can travel to. There's nothing you can possess. There's nothing you can acquire. There's no sports team, soccer club, or juice box that can fill the hole that we all have for God's love. There's nothing on this planet that can do it. Without God at the center of your life, at the very core of what you do and who you are, without being led and filled by God's Spirit every single day, we will end up chasing things that leave us empty. The very next weekend after I met Guy, we were opening a new campus in Anoka and we expected 5,000 people to show up. So I called Guy Fix. I said, Guy, would you be willing to donate ice cream to our new Anoka campus? And he said, absolutely. Well, 6,000 people came to that weekend service. These people didn't even get into the worship service. Four services. Lobby was packed every four services. 6,000 people. And at the end of each of our four services, I looked into the camera and I said, maybe it's time for some of you to finally taste and see that God is good. And then I said, for all of you at the Anoka campus, 
Kemp's wanted you to actually taste and see that Kemp's is good. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> so they donated 6,000 ice cream bars for you to grab on your way out, and the place went nuts. Kemp's truck was out there with some volunteers that Guy had recruited, and by the end of the weekend, Guy Fix was in tears. Not because of ice cream, but because of what he saw God do in a church. 6,000 new people came to taste and see. They took their first step away from sin and death and found that God and Kemp's are really pretty good. <laughs> and so that's what this book's all about. It comes from a deep place in my life. My own struggle. And I just had to write it. It took me three years. I poured everything into it that I know about this life. How to leave the old life of sin. How to start living every day in the new life of love and joy. So like I said earlier, it's just really great to be back. I love this church. I love you people. And I hope this is going to be a breakout year for everyone here. But you got to be led by God's Spirit. You got to identify and get honest about what sin is causing pain and loss. And you got to develop new desires by chasing after God every day. Next week uh, is going to be, I think, the pivotal week in this whole topic. It's really the centerpiece of the book. And I'll be talking about something that is really, I think God gave it to me by his spirit. And it changed how I look at this. And I think it's the key to the whole deal. And uh, so I invite you back. Don't miss. Bring a friend. Let's stand for prayer at all of our campuses. As we are standing at all of our campuses and those of you joining us online, would you just pause for 20 seconds or so in silence and breathe a prayer for families who, whose lives were tremendously altered, losing loved ones like that in El Paso and then last night in Dayton. Just pray, pray for those families, those communities. God, stuff like this happens because of sin. Plain and simple. There's evil in the world. It's not about a politic. It's not about a program. Plain and simple, there's evil in the world. But God, you have overcome the world. It's not a perfect place, far from it. But with your spirit living within every believer, we can make a difference, starting in our own families. I think the breakdown of the family, God, you know this, is really the culprit, the cause of things like this. So God, help us take care of our own families and lead our kids well, treat each other well, lead them to faith, and then make a difference in somebody else's life around us at work, at school. We need your help. We need your protection. Thank you that you love us the way you do. That no matter what happens, we're yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. God bless all of you. Yeah.